Music fans around the world were shocked and saddened last month at the unexpected death of Pink Floyd founder member Richard Wright. He was their keyboard player and the creator of some of the band's best love moments over their 40-year history. I'm Bob Harris, and for the next hour, we'll be remembering Richard in his own words, taken from his very last radio interview given in September 2007. It's his life, told in his own way, and illustrated with some choice moments from his Floyd catalogue, starting with this, from 1968's A Saucer Full of Secrets, Remember a Day. was with Pink Floyd right from the beginning, meeting Roger Waters and Nick Mason when all three were architecture students in London. They started off as a blues band, a little distant from Rick's first great musical love. But yes, my, my first love of music, apart from obviously classical music when I was much younger, because that's what my parents were playing all the time, was uh, listening to jazz. And my biggest influences was jazz, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, all these people. And I like the freedom of jazz, and I like the improvisation of jazz. And I think part of that came out in the early Floyd. Not that it was jazz, but the freedom to go wherever you want to go, instrumentally. We started off playing at people's private parties, various university functions, student union gigs and things like that. It was something I loved doing, and I certainly wanted to make music my career. And I didn't know if I wanted to be a jazz musician or whatever. It was just a, a start of um, realising that music was my vocation. 
or nothing would have happened at all and I would have been uh, designing toilet seats for the London County Council, which is, I say that because when we were in the architecture school, the first thing the guy said, he said, out of all of you, one might be an architect and half of you will be d designing toilet systems in housing and the other half will, won't make the grade. So, but um, I didn't want to be an architect. I think my, what also I wanted to be was a photographer. I thought, if music doesn't work, I'll always play music, but if I can't make a living out of it, I'm going to be a photographer. And I went actually to, you know, I, had, I went to a lessons in photography. Um, that, was, that was an option I would have done in my life. Whether I could have been a great photographer, I have no idea. But I never thought that that time this band would become what it is. And we were playing art, rhythm and blues, Chuck Berry numbers, that's Domino. I mean, all, all, we, we started off like that. It's when Sid joined with all these incredible songs that it changed. <laughs> But misunderstands oh, She's often inclined to borrow Somebody's dreams till tomorrow There is no other day Let's try it another way You'll lose your mind and play Three games away The arrival of Sid Barrett marked the beginning of Pink Floyd's first great creative period, with psychedelic pop songs like See Emily Play alternating with more experimental pieces of work. I think at that time, anything, you could do anything. Um, so, I mean, sure, there were some nights we played terribly badly, and other nights we played very well. Um, and we were still, we were still learning. We were still actually learning how to play in the beginning. I was, I mean, I'm, you know, everyone was. And so it was all very experimental. But in those days, people accepted anything. I mean, when we did games for May, at the Festival Hall, I mean, they would sit religiously and see us sitting on stage making cups of tea and having a clockwork toy running around the stage with, with someone holding a microphone. I mean, it was very sort of, um, let's say, experimental. And I have to say, looking back, some of it was pretty embarrassing, like Games for May. But to be honest, we possibly did all this improvisation because we hadn't yet come up with constructive songs to perform. And plus, um, Sid didn't really want to play his songs live. He had this thing, he didn't really want... I mean, we never played See Emily Play, I don't think, live. We never played Arnold Lane live until, actually, David Gilmour's tour, when I sang it. Arnold Lane Had a
As is well known, Sid Barrett left Pink Floyd in 1967, and his replacement, arriving in early 1968, was David Gilmour, who Rick continued to play with right up to the very end. So after Sid, um, there definitely was, we had to change our approach, I, I think. I didn't know David until the, the day he came in for the first rehearsal. He's a good guitarist and a very nice man. And as I say, when David came in, it certainly did change our approach, because he was a proper musician. No, I'm joking. Um, I claim I was a musician at the same time, but um, he did, I mean, he was more interested in other things rather than just the pure experimentation. And I think he found it difficult, maybe, because he had to try and recreate how Sid you'd play the guitar, which he can do now perfectly. But I think he wanted to go in a new direction, and quite right so. In the very beginning, I mean, the idea was Sid to stay at home and write, continue to write, well, like, rather like Brian Wilson, that's in the Beach Boys, and, uh, and David to come on tour and play guitar like Sid would, and, but it didn't work out, one, because Sid didn't write. And uh, I think we were in a bit of limbo at this time. OK, how do we carry on from here? And um, I think, as David said, there was two different bands. There was the Sid Barrett Pink Floyd and the post-Sid Barrett Pink Floyd, two totally different approaches to music. actually asked Jeff Beck to join <laughs> at one point and uh, he turned us down which is funny because my two favorite guitarists if you ask me now two of my favorite guitarists are Jeff Beck and David Gilmore Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton they were basically their love was blues but I think Jeff took it further than Eric Clapton in terms of how he would approach the guitar not saying Eric Clapton is no good, I'm just saying I think Jeff was mm. a bit more experimental at that time with what he could do with the guitar. But um, no, David didn't change many things and also had a remarkable voice, vocal too.
Casting around for a new direction, Pink Floyd spent some time in 1969 and 1970 writing music for films, an experience that Rick found especially fulfilling. We did Obscure by Clouds, Moore, Sabrisky Point. Um, that was something I was very interested in, personally, because I love the idea of what music can do to visuals. And... Um, so it was a very interesting time. But you're kind of restricted as well, you know. Oh, we need two minutes of this. And, two, and it's got to be totally in sync with the movie and everything like that. But again, it was fun to do. Great fun. Although I have to say, one of the things that came out of Sabrisky Point was... Um, I don't even talk about this later, but us and them as was... We were trying to do the violent sequence in Sobrisky Point, which is where the students are being beaten up by the Kent State Police. Anyway, so everything we came up with, he said, yeah, I like it, and then 10 minutes later, no, I don't like it. And it was all kind of very loud, violent type of music. And then I was sitting at the piano watching it, and I started playing this sequence, which is now us and, us and them. And he loved it for about 10 minutes and then rejected it. And I have to say, I'm very happy he rejected it.
dig it. I mean, you got off line because I couldn't give you a fraction of life in one So the difference in right and wrong, I mean, good manners don't cost nothing, do they? Hey. In 1971, Dark Side of the Moon was still some time in the future, but the year did see the creation of one of the all-time great Floyd classics, Echoes. We needed a new direction, and I think Echoes stemmed really from the history of the Floyd before, where live we would be doing lots of experimental improvisation, and Echoes is basically an improvised piece, and then constructed and put together in quite a formal way, in the end. It all came out of this one ping note, um, which was in Abbey Road, and um, I don't know, I think it may be Roger said, I wonder what the piano sounds like going through a Leslie. And um, I said, yeah, I'd love to know what it sounds like. And then, of course, all the boffins said it's not possible. So we then said, well, build something. So make something up that will do that because it didn't exist anyway so from that sound of the piano that's how echoes was born if you like and uh, it was a great time a great thing was that it was i think a huge contribution from all of us to make that piece of music but all the things like the piano the wonderful guitar sounds which i call the seagull sounds that david does. That was an, that was basically a mistake by one of the road managers who plugged his uh, wah wah pedal back to front. So when he played it, he heard this terrible squawk. Now most people say to the roadie, "Oh, you put it in the wrong way. Put it." And David immediately thought, "I can make sounds with this," and which is what how that happened. And Roger on the bass with the which I call the wind section. That's just Roger with a a steel just running over the strings of the bass. A wonderful sound. The great thing about in those days of recording was we were very restricted in the number of tracks we could go on to. Very restricted with the instruments we had. Um, like for example, there's no sampling in those days, nothing like that. So 
you have the drums, the bass, the keyboard, and and uh, guitar, and that's what you were limited to. No other sound. So we had to create sounds through those four instruments, which was a very exciting thing to do. Um, whereas nowadays, you've got every single sound you'd ever hope to want on Pro Tools or whatever. And so uh, I think there's something magical about just being having the four instruments and seeing what sounds you can make out of them.
music aside, Pink Floyd were also becoming very well known for their powerful graphic style, developed by the band themselves and designers Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell, better known as Hypnosis. We were, all of us, interested in the artwork and how it was done and all got very much involved in it. And, um, and again, like the music, let's do something different. You can't do that. You can't just have a picture of a cow. That doesn't sell records. Well, this is what we want. You can't package your album in a black sleeve with no writing on it. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, but we're going to do it. Dark Side of the Moon, for example, which I think is one of the most effective album covers that we've ever made. That all stemmed from... Um, Basically, at that time, it was doing all these psychedelic album covers and masses of stuff and images all over the cover. I do actually remember saying to Storm, let's try and do something very simple and graphic. Dark Side of the Moon was released in March 1973, it immediately became apparent that this was Pink Floyd's defining work. And on an album of thrilling moments, perhaps the most thrilling of all was Richard's The Great Gig in the Sky. Oh, that was, um, I think we're nearing the end of recording Dark Side of the Moon and uh, we need, we need, we need uh, one more piece or something like that, or we need an instrumental at this point. Rick, go home and come up with something. Sure. And uh, spent a few days at home and then brought the sequence back in. And they liked very much. And, uh, and then the whole story of Claire Torrid singing a remarkable vocal on top. We tried guitar and... Um, and then, don't know who suggested me or Roger or David, I'm not sure, or even, I don't know, but let's try a vocalist on it. Let's, check, let's do someone do it like a lead vocal with no lyrics. And, uh, which was pretty um, hard for anyone to do that, because they would expect to have the notes written down for them and lyrics to sing to. But Claire Torrey, I mean, with a lot of prompting, did it. I mean, I have to say, listening to the... I mean, I love the sequence. I'm extremely proud of actually the whole chordal structure. It's a very interesting... I won't go into it now, but it's a very interesting way the chords actually change and the harmonies in them. But um, in the in the loud section, we call it, and when she starts kind of virtually screaming, it was, wow, this is pretty powerful stuff.
there was something very magical about it and it actually required you to listen for some reason it required you to listen from the beginning to the end it's one of those albums where people would have put want to put it on the beginning and go all the way through to the end not pick out certain songs and say this is my favorite song they would say this is my favorite album and i think at the time there weren't many albums like that the enormous success of Dark Side, especially in America, meant that Floyd started to play bigger and bigger gigs, an experience that proved to be bittersweet for Richard. Um, yeah, it was after Dark Side, I suppose, when we, we went into all the stadium gigs. Um, part of it was great, great fun. I mean, it was, you know, a pretty big boost to ego to be playing to 100,000 people and, and all that. But... But looking back, I was never really... I loved all the lights. I loved all the, you know, all the dynamics of the lights that were being done at the same time. But musically, I wasn't that content because you can't really hear what the band are playing too, too well. It's all... Not on stage so much, but the PA is blasting out. And um, so musically, it was a bit frustrating. And also once we got to the wall where we were playing because we we're having so many films and we had to play to click tracks and stuff you're very restricted you couldn't just go off and improvise or change keys or anything because you're completely locked into all the visuals so that was a restriction i mean i still think they were brilliant shows you know, i see nothing I and mean, the wall was fantastic but it wasn't like, you know, the recent tour with David, it was just a joy to play, because we had no click tracks. He could change his mind what we were going to play, and often did. We could extend solos, we could... whatever. We, it was totally free on stage, which was... that's what I love. I'm Bob Harris, and you're listening to Radio 2's tribute to Pink Floyd's Richard Wright. With increased success, there also came a change in Pink Floyd's music, particularly from the pen of Roger Waters. But it was becoming more concise. Roger was definitely developing, as we all know, his um, thing about the war, about death, about... I mean, well, I don't have to describe it. Everyone knows what he was obsessed with at that time. So that writing became much more clearer and focused on what he wanted to say. And because of that, the music became more, if you like, structured and direct. Which is fine with me. I, it didn't bother me at all. By 1979, in the recording of the Wall album, the relationship between Richard and Roger had become significantly worse. There was definitely some kind of animosity between me and Roger by this point. Um, I was doing everything I could. Um, you have to ask other people about it. Um, it wasn't the most fun recording, what I can say, making the wall. Um, he was being very bullish and I was possibly being a bit weak, to be honest. We don't need no education Floyd took the wall out on the road for an epic series of live shows, which saw the band playing behind an actual wall, built up brick by brick by brick during the performance. They were spectacular events, but for Richard, also difficult and emotional ones. 
playing behind the wall was very weird, but I knew that it was a brilliant, brilliant theatrical event. And I suppose it's like um, sometimes if you're involved in a beautiful theatre, you can accept that it's often not so much fun to be playing the music or you're restricted, but you're a part of a huge event. I was in a situation where I kind of agreed to leave the band at this point. I mean, I remember often sitting down with Steve O'Rourke on plane, going to America and saying, Steve, I've got to leave the, I'm going to leave the band. I you know, just, you know, I can't find this whole ego trip going on with Roger. And I said, it's just not much fun anymore. Um, but I had recorded the whole album with them and I had thought I'd done some nice work on it. And I said, OK, well, well I, I won't get into the whole story why I left the band, but why it happened. But I did say, I want to finish this project with you. I go out and play it live, and which they happily agreed to. So, um, so in that, it was kind of a very emotional time for me because I was on stage saying, mm, well, this is maybe the last time I'm going to play with Floyd, or is the last time, but I'm going to give it the best I can. And so it was kind of an emotional time and probably difficult for all, all of us, actually. Well, not just me, but for Roger and Dave and Nick, knowing that I'm on stage playing, but I won't be playing again. So, in some ways, I was pretty scared leaving the band because at the time, financially, we were possibly bankrupt. Um, but I wasn't scared in terms of what I'd do musically. I said, I can always carry on. Maybe not in such a big band as Floyd, but I will always, you know. Um, but yeah, it was a very sad time um, as well. I, mean, I was going to miss playing with David and Nick and, and Roger, despite the way he was behaving. So, um, some way scary. I might have had to go back and be a photographer. No, it's... Um, it was a painful time, that's for sure. After Richard left, the story of Pink Floyd became increasingly one of argument and lawsuit. But with Roger Waters gone, David Gilmour and Nick Mason pressed on, releasing the albums A Momentary Lapse of Reason in 1987 and The Division Bell in 1994, accompanying both with spectacular tours. I think um, after the wall I was in Greece and I heard David was making a new album, and uh, I got in touch with him, or I got in touch, I'm not quite sure quite how it happened, said, if you want me to come and play any Hammond on your new album, I'd be very happy to. And uh, he said, sure, let's have lunch and see, you know, we hadn't seen each other for a while. Actually, that isn't truly true, I saw him in Greece, because we both used to go to the same place called Lindos, and he was there, and that's where I said, if you ever want me to play. Um, I'd be very happy to, and um, that's how it started. And so I didn't do so much on Momentary Lapse of Reason um, because he's already halfway through. But then did the tour with them. And Division Bell, of course, is is very much a Floyd album in the in the classic sense. Well, in in the classic sense, it's the three of us all together from the beginning, and I did write co-write with David and quite a few of the songs on it 
the instrumentals marooned and all these things and cluster one so it was it was the first album where David and me were starting to work to write together again which is good After the tour supporting the Division Bell, Pink Floyd effectively stood back, reuniting just once in 2005 for Live 8. Until this year, Richard was still recording and touring with David Gilmour, who said in tribute, he was gentle, unassuming and private, but his soulful voice and playing were vital, magic components of our most recognized Pink Floyd sound. I've never played with anyone quite like him. Richard's untimely death means that the partnership is finally broken and that poignantly one of his fondest hopes must now go unrealised. I would love to go out and do, let's say, one more tour with the Floyd. Not just financially, just as a sort of part of history. Um, I, I think it would be great to do. And with these words... 